Olá, bom dia a todos. Acho que já estamos live. Isto deve ser daquelas frases que mais se, se ouve nas nossas reuniões hoje em dia, tudo por Zoom interativo, portanto, acho que nós em termos técnicos estamos a funcionar bem, temos som, temos imagem. Uh, uh, bom dia a todos outra vez. Nós vamos dar início à nossa Kiss, a Kiss, a Keynote Presentation com Sara Davis. Eu vou, estou a falar agora inicialmente em português, eu já vou apresentar a Sara. A, toda a sessão será em inglês. Aproveito agora esta parte inicial apenas para deixar dois ou três uh, comentários. As pessoas que quiserem, nós vamos. Do, a Sara vai fazer a sua apresentação de vi, entre 20 a 30 minutos. Uh, depois iremos passar para a sessão de QA. O que é que eu peço a todas as pessoas que nos estejam a ouvir é que utilizem o chat do, que encontram aqui do vosso lado direito. Não utilizem o event, porque é transversal a todo o evento. Utilizem o do stage ou do palco, onde encontram aí que eu anei e podem fazer as perguntas. A Ana Matias, que está connosco, também a ajudar a moderar esta sessão, irá estar a, 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 a atuar sobre esses comentários, poderá responder a perguntas, vai selecionar algumas. Pessoas, o que é que eu peço também? Vocês vão colocando logo as vossas perguntas. Escrevam logo as vossas perguntas. Porquê? Porque outras pessoas podem votar. E nós iremos dar preferência às perguntas que tiverem mais votos, de modo a podermos distribuir de alguma maneira. Uh, no entanto, tentaremos, de acordo, dependendo do número de perguntas que tivermos, tentaremos uh, uh, que todas sejam colocadas à Sara, que eu depois irei passar para ela. Uh, portanto, é apenas isso. E uh, julgo que vamos passar. I will be switching to English now. Uh, uh, and first of all, Once again, I would like to give a warm welcome to Sarah Davis for her patience for this long days of, of emails and tests and so on. But thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be here and be our keynote uh, speaker at our conference. Conference, I'm really excited about this. Sarah Davis is a well-known science communication author and researcher, and whose work I must confess, this is a personal note I really admire. After so long reading her work, citing her work, it's an honest pleasure to be here uh, sharing a session with her. Sara's work has been relevant, very relevant to the field, both to researchers and both to practitioners, but also her, her writing is so clear and so well structured. So uh, thank you for that, Sara. Sara Davis is a professor of techno sciences, and I hope, I hope now I say this name right, techno sciences, materiality and digital cultures, at the Department of Science and Technology Studies of University of Vienna. She completed her PhD in 2008 at Imperial College London. She worked in the UK, USA, Norway and Denmark. Denmark as a Marie Curie International Fellow before becoming an associate professor. She published several books. The most recent one, I hope this is the most recent one. She's so prolific on her work exploring science communication. But let me mention another one that I really enjoyed, and I think this is my opinion, every science communication practitioner should read. It's Science Communication, Culture, Identity and Citizenship that she wrote with Maya Erst. Uh, I really enjoyed that book and thank you again. She also published enormous papers. I will not cite them or give you any numbers, please. In uh, several specialized and relevant journals. She's a co-founder of the Science and Public Conference seat, uh, series. She sits on the conference uh, scientific committee of the PCST network and given numerous keynote talks around the world. The title of her talk today is What's the point of science communication? Reflecting on science communication's role in society. In my opinion, a very a much necessary and sometimes overlooked topic in our field. We assume some things and we shouldn't when we should always be reflexive about our work. So nobody's here to listen to me. Without further ado, I will give the stage to Sara. Thank you again, Sara. Oh, thank you, Manuel. Thank you for the extremely nice uh, and kind introduction. Thank you also for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, it's really an honor. And uh, Manuel, I'm really delighted that you say that you enjoy my writing and find it useful and that you think um, kind of practitioners generally also find it useful. I do often worry that as an, uh, a researcher, I too easily live in a rather closed academic community. Um, I'm extremely happy uh, if my work has relevance and is meaningful to people who are actually uh, at the coalface of science communication. Um, let me just share my screen. So as Manuel has said, the theme I want to think about today um, and discuss with you is this question, what's the point of 
science communication, a question that I guess everybody here has their own answer or answers to. Um, but what I want to do in posing this question is to reflect specifically on science communication's role in society. Uh, so if we, as I guess we all do, feel that science communication is important, why exactly is that the case? How does it fit in with broader ideas and understandings of our societies today? Uh, that's my theme. Uh, as I suggested, I would very much like to have this as a discussion with you uh, to get your thoughts and experiences uh, on this. Maybe I will start, though, with an anecdote from a science communication experience that I have had, um, a moment where I um, engaged with an aspect of science. And so this story comes from a few years ago. I was traveling um, from Scandinavia, where I was working, to a conference in Bonn uh, in Germany. Uh, this was the winter. For some reason, I had convinced myself that because I was going south, it would be really warm and sunny. Uh, I flew into Bonn and it immediately became clear that this was not the case. Um, I had left myself some time before the conference, so I had a day to kill. Um, and I remember walking through the streets of Bonn. It was really cold, uh, snowing, sleeting, this icy wind. It turned out that um, in this part of Germany, at least, uh, all the shops or the cafes were closed uh, because it was a Sunday. Uh, and I really um, kind of felt annoyed with myself that I'd let myself in for this somewhat miserable experience. I was trailing around the city, uh, trying to find somewhere uh, to shelter and something to do. I, I realized that one of the very few places that was open um, on this Sunday was a, a museum of maths and calculating machines. So really, through a process of elimination, I found myself in this museum, um, drifting around, looking at the exhibits, um, uh, really enjoying the, the space, the warmth, the fact that I was inside uh, in shelter, and the, the kind of collection of these really interesting and beautiful calculating machines from different time periods uh, and different cultures. So I had a really nice couple of hours in this museum. It was, um, as you see, I think very attractively presented. Um, and I really enjoyed looking at these objects. What I didn't take from this experience, though, was any real understanding of how these worked. Um, you might see from the picture, um, the, the explanation of these machines is in um, uh, A4 sheets of paper, quite dense text um, that you had to pick up and read. It was too much for me. It was too complicated. I was too tired. Um, so really, I just enjoyed looking at these um, devices. And as I say, being in a warm, nice space that was colorful. I was very grateful to this museum at the time. But that experience has stayed with me, as you can tell, because in some ways it made me think about um, purposes of science communication and um, what counts as a successful piece or experience of science communication. Was this a failure because I didn't uh, take in any of the information that if you asked me now, I really couldn't tell you much about um, how these machines worked, uh, the mathematical principles behind them, um, even the, the um, spaces and cultures that they came from. I really didn't feel like I gained a lot of information. I had a nice time though. Uh, so this, I think, raises one question about what we want from our uh, science communication, what we want people to take from uh, science communication experiences, uh, and what is a failed moment of communication and what uh, does success look like? And it's these kinds of themes that I want to reflect on, um, hopefully and not at too much length, uh, in the rest of my presentation today. What's the point of science communication? What does success look like? As I've already said, I think everybody um, listening here today will immediately have some answers to this question. Um, we all have um, rationales and purposes for what we do. Some that might come to your minds include wanting to change particular kinds of behaviors in our audiences, perhaps relating to environmental practices, 
um, encouraging people to behave in more sustainable ways, uh, or perhaps relating to, to health behaviors. Um, so there might be a desire to change how people um, uh, behave in their everyday lives. Another purpose that might come to mind is uh, wanting to share a sense of wonder, to share amazement and awe at the natural world and the scientific practices that allow us to uh, look at that. Uh, we might also want to encourage young people to study science. We want, might want to share the wonders of science and excitement about science um, with younger people to bring them into um, studying science and perhaps becoming part of the scientific community. These are just a few of the rationales that I think um, often uh, lie behind scientific um, science communication. Again, I'm sure you uh, have others, can think of others as well. What I want to do, though, is to um, step back from these perhaps immediate um, rationales and purposes and reflect on how these um, fit into wider society. Um, so if we have all these immediate um, ideas in mind when we think about the point of science communication, our science communication, um, how can we think about these in terms of broader purposes and values to the society that we live in, the societies that we live in? I hope there's not too much background noise for you. Um, there is kind of never-ending building work going on in my building, uh, and it seems to have got a little bit noisier uh, today, so I apologize. And in reflecting on this question, what's the point of science communication, I want to draw particularly uh, on some research I carried out with colleagues uh, rather recently, uh, as well as reflecting a little bit on the, the science communication literature. So this research has been carried out as part of the QUEST project. This is a European project that looks at quality and effectiveness in science communication and has a number of activities, um, both around mapping the landscape of science communication, but also thinking about how to incentivize um, and promote good practice in science communication. It's a much bigger project. Um, we have uh, a lot of partners from across Europe if you're interested, the, the web address is on the slide there. This part of the research though, or this part of the project, um, this focused very specifically on the landscape of European science communication research and teaching. Uh, so as part of this, my colleagues and I were talking to scholars and teachers across Europe about their ideas about science communication um, and science communication research, their um, uh, sense of what is best practice or not, um, and also how they saw the role and the value of science communication. So from this interview study, um, I want to draw out um, patterns in how people talked about these broader purposes of science communication. What I have found, uh, or what I want to argue, emerged from that material uh, were um, at least six ways of thinking about the societal purpose of science communication, at least six ways of answering the question, what is the point? I say at least because my sense is that this is um, work in progress. Um, uh, again, something I would like to discuss with you is whether there are other ways of framing these societal purposes uh, and roles. Okay, so when we spoke to scholars and teachers of science communication and also looked at the scholarly literature, what did they have to say about um, the purpose of science communication in society? What we found, as I've said, is six key themes, um, six kind of categories in which people's explanations broke down into. The first of which we could um, label uh, as being about accountability, legitimacy, and responsibility. So here there was a sense that science communication is important, it's necessary, 
um, because it is part of the social contract that science has with society. Uh, so arguments here uh, circled around the fact that science is publicly funded, uh, that our tax, uh, our taxes uh, often are paying for much science and that there therefore is a responsibility of science and scientists to um, communicate their work to um, the people who are paying for it, uh, in effect. So as in the quote uh, on the screen, there was this notion that those who receive public funding for their research have a duty to explain how that money is spent. This is about accountability, showing that you are using public funds responsibly. It's also about uh, legitimacy. So people said um, this is a way of legitimizing what you're doing by being open uh, and accessible to um, citizens within a society. It's a responsibility uh, that science and scientists have. So this was one theme. A second theme, a second cluster of responses about the um, role and value of science communication uh, related essentially to democracy, enhancing and supporting democracy. So here the argument is that science communication is important because it enables um, uh, better democratic processes. It equips citizens to um, make good decisions, for instance, when they're voting, perhaps to support science-based uh, positions. It enables citizens to be empowered to uh, participate in public debate on uh, scientific topics. Uh, and it um, supports a wider community and society where science is critically examined along democratic lines, where uh, you can have deliberative processes where people reflect on science and scientific practice, and where science is, again, somewhat held to account. Um, so here, one scholar in the quote um, frames science communication very much as being about deliberation on how knowledge is being uh, produced, created, and transferred in a society today. So science communication here, it's about deliberation, it's about equipping citizens, empowering them, uh, and ultimately enhancing democracy. A third cluster of responses uh, essentially relate to the argument that science is um, a, a part of culture, it is part of our shared heritage. Uh, it is, as in the quote, one of our greatest achievements, and it therefore should be widely accessible. Um, just as with art or music or other traditions, um, cultural traditions in our societies, it's something we should celebrate and be proud of. Um, it's something that everyone, again, should be able to, to access. Um, so there, there's a sense here um, that science is, um, pleasurable, uh, it's something to be enjoyed, and that everyone should be able to do that. A fourth set of responses or arguments about the value of science communication, these are more instrumental or um, practical or pragmatic in their orientation. Um, so, science communication is important because it serves particular instrumental purposes. And this argument cuts both ways. So, science communication here is important to publics and public audiences and to policymakers, but it can also be useful to scientists themselves. In the quote, you get this idea that um, what science has to offer is a quality um, in terms of knowledge production that hardly any other fields of society can bring. Uh, getting that knowledge, that robust knowledge into individual, institutional, societal decisions, this is important. Uh, so if science is producing robust, trustworthy knowledge, then it's of course useful um, as we make uh, individual choices. Um, do we get vaccinated or not? How do we behave with regard to, to the environment? Uh, science can be a resource in those kinds of decisions. It can also be a resource for policy. 
uh, and political discussion. Um, so here again, it's, it's something useful that can aid um, good decision making. But also um, in the context of um, deliberative formats and dialogue, uh, science communication is useful to scientists also because it gives them access to societal views and values, public knowledges and experiences uh, that may help them in their research and in their scientific decisions. Um, here then there is a whole suite of arguments around the usefulness, uh, the pragmatic purposes of science communication. So I guess so far we've talked about um, democracy, culture, um, instrumental or pragmatic purposes, accountability. I guess most of us have been nodding, you know, yes, 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 this all sounds good. Um, th these are things that I can imagine my science communication fitting into. Interestingly, though, um, in the interviews, um, a kind of rationale or a role for science communication also emerged that people were not so enthusiastic about. It was a kind of um, anti-rationale, if you like. People talked in the interviews a lot about science communication as increasingly a form of marketing or promotion, um, something that is unreflective, that is public relations activity, that is simply um, wanting to, to cheerlead for science without supporting democracy or debate. Um, and this was something that people saw had a role. It was playing a part within um, universities were generally singled out uh, for this. It was um, also present, of course, in um, uh, kind of businesses and their communication. Uh, so it had a role that most people wanted to distance themselves uh, from it. Uh, so as in the quote, another kind of science communication which makes me uncomfortable is what they called uh, image compet um, competitivity competition in science. Um, so all universities or all institutions have a communication department, not to be more close to people, but to make their own advertisement, trying to attract stakeholders or, or money or so on. So here, this um, role for science communication, attracting stakeholders or money, um, was noticed, um, but people were often critical of this. It was seen as being in opposition to some of the more democratic um, purposes uh, and roles of science communication. I, I want to come back to this argument in a minute because I think actually I wouldn't necessarily align myself with this kind of critique, um, but I, I will just finish um, before circling around to that again. The sixth rationale or, or role for science communication in society this actually was not really present in the interview data, um, but when you look at science communication literature, you do find the argument that there are economic purposes for science communication. Uh, this is summed up in the quote from um, the science education scholar, Jonathan Osborne. He says, an advanced technological society needs a constant supply of scientists to sustain its economic base. Um, so here the argument is science communication is important because it equips workers. Um, so people already in the labor market, um, they may need new technical skills. They may need um, scientific or technical knowledge to help them in their work. Science communication is part of that. Uh, more generally, um, we find here arguments about the need to recruit people into science. So. Um, uh, as I started with at the very beginning, the idea that we might want to encourage young people from diverse backgrounds to be interested in science, to see it as a career, and therefore to um, bring more people into working uh, into science and technology, um, something that's seen um, as necessary for kind of maintaining our knowledge, our technology-driven societies. So these are the six um, rationales that emerged from, from this research. 
Um, and, and what is clear, of course, is that they are different uh, in the reasoning, the logics behind them, but they are also overlapping. Uh, so science communication has multiple roles in society. It plays a number of different parts in sustaining um, the societies that we live in. It, importantly, I think these roles are not exclusive. Um, they overlap within particular instances of communication. So we can be sharing science as a part of our cultural heritage and also be wanting to encourage young people into science um, at the same time, for instance. Uh, these things will overlap within uh, everyday practice um, uh, of science communication. What is also important, I think, is that um, we don't necessarily have to agree with the sharp distinction that many of our interviewees drew between kind of science communication as marketing um, and these more democratic um, rationales for science communication. Uh, so this relates also to some discussion in the, the literature around um, the difference between what Susanna Priest calls strategic and democratic forms of communication, which roughly align with the, the democratic uh, ideals that I've talked about and the, the marketing and uh, PR forms of communication. So for Priest, she says, okay, we can see that there can be different uh, aims at stake. Um, some science communication is strategic. We want to advertise or publicize particular lines of thought or institutions or even people. Um, but we don't necessarily have to um, see that as always diametrically opposed to also enabling critical debate and discussion. So even these strategic forms, even these more um, one way, we might say, forms of publicity, um, they can also nurture discussion, accountability, legitimacy, um, and have um, kind of instrumental, useful instrumental outputs uh, as well. So we have these six roles uh, as a starting point, I think, for answering this question, what's the point of science communication? How can we think about its value and importance within our societies. I want, what I want to do um, as I close or start to close though, is maybe step out even further again um, to say, how do these six um, roles, how do they relate to each other? Can we, um, can we take them even further? Can we um, uh, combine them uh, in further ways? What I want to argue is when we do that, when we step out again, um, we can really see these roles as being fundamentally related to questions or assumptions or aspirations about the kinds of societies we want to live in together. Uh, so on the one hand, we can see that many of these ideas of the purposes of science communication, they do exactly relate to democracies democracy, to supporting democratic processes. Um, so here we see the importance of critical debate, um, the importance of holding science accountable, of um, maintaining that contract between science and society, and opening science up to inclusive democratic processes. Even the way in which um, our interviewees talked about uh, marketing and um, strategic forms of communication, the way that they critiqued these implies that the, uh, the opposite of these, or what they framed as the opposite of these, uh, was what they wanted to promote and encourage. So if um, marketing and um, unreflected publicity was bad, um, then that was because it was not doing these um, uh, more democratically oriented functions of enabling critical debate, empowering citizens, uh, being inclusive in how we discuss science.
So this is perhaps one um, broader argument uh, around the purposes of science communication. Science communication is important because it relates to democracy. But I think some of the other arguments also kind of assume or make the case that um, science communication uh, is important because we wish to live in equitable societies. Uh, so in several of these rationales, there is the assumption or the idea that public goods, whether that is knowledge or culture and heritage or economic benefits, these should be widely shared. These should be accessible to uh, everyone in societies. So here, for instance, when we see these pragmatic or instrumental arguments for the value of science communication, these very much relate to the idea that science is useful and therefore many people should have access to it. Similarly, with arguments for the cultural value of science. Science is beautiful, it's part of our heritage, it's an impressive achievement, therefore uh, everyone should be able to have access to it. So here, the thinking or the logic that lies behind these, these rationales um, relates to perhaps the way that we wish to live in societies that are not only democratic, but also equitable. To sum up then, um, I think what I would like to argue from this material, from looking at these rationales and how they relate to each other, is that science communication is important for at least two reasons. It's important for democracy and for governing science, discussing science in democratic societies. Um, but it's also important because sharing knowledge uh, and the benefits associated with it uh, is the ethically correct thing to do. It is the just thing to do um, so that people have access to these aesthetic, practical or economic benefits uh, of science. What I want to emphasize from making this argument um, is therefore that we have gone from thinking about very immediate purposes for our science communication to essentially the reinforcement of um, or the um, uh, kind of thinking about ideals about how our societies should function. Uh, so we can travel from our immediate practices um, and purposes in doing uh, science communication in particular contexts through to thinking about how this fits into wider societies through to thinking uh, about the kinds of societies we wish to live in. When we carry out science communication, we are reinforcing or perhaps seeking to build particular ideals about how our societies should function, how we should live together within them. So I have discussed this question of how we can answer the, um, what is the point of science communication? How can we frame its importance, its value within uh, society? Why does this matter? What are the implications of these arguments or findings? There are, I think, at least two things that I would like to raise or to suggest as uh, implications. The first, which I, um, I, again, think we all know, but perhaps um, can always be repeated. The first is simply the idea that our science communication activities are important. Um, they are significant because they relate to these big concepts like democracy and equity. Uh, our science communication activities of all kinds on all scales um, they relate to the kinds of societies we wish to build. Uh, and we should therefore value um, our activities uh, on whatever scale they are being carried out. It can sound rather grand, I think, or, or rather um, grandiose to say, yes, I do science communication because I care about democracy. But this is one way of really valuing what we are doing and appreciating uh, the importance of these, these activities and processes. That's one implication. I, I think a second um, 
again relates to the ability to to step back uh, and to use perhaps these rationales as a way of reflecting on um, our, our science communication practices. Science communication, I, I know that, you, of course, you know this, I think, much better than I. Uh, science communication is complicated. Um, our immediate rationales may be very close to home. We may carry out particular communication activities because we have been given a budget for it, because that is in our job description, because we have to do something by the end of the year, um, it, because someone else asks us to. Um, we, um, science communication is often carried out in kind of constrained, under constrained uh, budgets and circumstances uh, and timeframes. I think, though, um, perhaps what these rationales, what this discussion can do um, is to enable us to step away from these immediate rationales and purposes uh, and constraints and to really think about the broader aims of our activities. Um, how do they relate to these um, uh, societal rationales, such as sharing culture or uh, enabling economic development? Um, how can we understand our, our activities in these terms and how can we then perhaps reframe or refocus and correctly value them? Which of these rationales, which of these purposes do we want to aim for perhaps in particular and how might that affect our everyday practices? I have just seen that I have uh, spoken already for longer than I wanted to. I was going to return to my to my anecdote, but I think I will skip that and move straight on to um, raising some questions uh, in particular for discussion and also inviting you, of course, to, to raise questions and also to share your experiences. So questions that I continue to have um, around this, this material, these arguments. Is anything missing? Um, in particular, given that the interview data comes from discussions with scholars and teachers in Europe, this is a rather limited data set. Um, what would happen if we asked publics uh, or different kinds of public audiences? Um, do you see anything missing from this um, outline of potential rationales? I'm also curious how you make sense of these arguments with relation to your own practices. What is the point of your public communication? Again, it sounds a little blunt when you put it like that, um, but how do you see your work as relating to wider society? And a big question, of course, uh, what kind of society do you wish to create? Um, do these ideals of democracy and equity, do they make sense? Um, do you see them as part of your practices and aims? Um, uh, yeah, how, do, how again do they relate to um, what you're doing? These are things I would particularly be interested in hearing your, your views on. Um, of course, uh, other questions and comments are very welcome as well. As I close, sorry, Manuel, um, to take five minutes just over closing, I must acknowledge again the Quest Project uh, and my colleagues on it, particularly Trina, Trina Unanda, who carried out many of the interviews. And if you're interested, um, this material has been published in an article in Science Communication. I will stop sharing my screen and I really look forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was a really interesting and important discussion that we should have on the reflection of, about our work and what are our goals and what are the roles of science communication society. So, Thank you so much. Don't worry about the time. <laughs> it took a little bit longer, but I think it was worth it. So let me see here in the Q&A session. Uh, uh, um, Anna Matias is, oh, we have a lot of questions here. Okay, uh, so we have to start. Let me be a little selfish, if I can. And let me ask you, while I'm going through this, because I have a problem with this, it's, I, I, if, I, if I start reading, I stop talking. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you think you, uh, 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 in your project you had um, uh, scholars, right? The interviews were with scholars of science communication. Do you think, uh, maybe, uh, it's always hard because I'm asking an opinion, of course. Do you think it's, if you ask this on a sample of partitions that it would be very different? Or you see, you talked about like the, the scholars were a bit ashamed when they talked about the marketing 
purposes of science communication. Do you think that would be the case if it was the practitioners, or do they? Do you think that they would feel more safe uh, speaking about this purpose and not in the, in a bad way? I will scroll so, to the questions now to see the next one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a really interesting question. Um, and in terms of whether practitioners would say something different, um, I, I, I am not sure. Um, but perhaps there would be a little more nuance in this kind of critique of um, public relations. Also, because as part of my research, I have you know talked to people in these these roles, you know, in communications departments in universities, for instance. And I have always found that these people are very reflective, okay. um, very thoughtful and actually do not simply see what they're doing as um, publicizing science in, in this um, very simplistic way. So perhaps, um, yeah, if we'd spoken to practitioners, particularly people involved in these kinds of institutions or um, roles, there would be a bit more reflection over exactly the overlap between doing marketing and also promoting democracy. I, I really don't think that these things are diametrically opposed, um, but perhaps some of the scholars that we spoke to, um, that was not so easy uh, to see. I, I'm curious actually for other people, I mean, if you had been interviewed, everyone in the audience, what, what would you have said? I, I wonder very much actually also if we had spoken to citizens um, whether slightly different things would have emerged. Because um, one thing that I think perhaps might also be missing, and this does in fact relate to my experience in Bonn, um, is a kind of sense that science communication can meet um, needs in terms of wanting to be entertained, wanting a leisure activity, wanting something to, to fill time. This was not something, I mean, we can talk about that as a kind of cultural, aspect of science, um, but it wasn't something that was talked about particularly explicitly um, in in our interviews, and I wonder if that might come through from talking to, to lay people. I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will go, I will not, I, I had a lot of questions, but I have to respect the audience, of course, and we have a lot of, I will go through the ones that were most voted for the other, for the other participants, so I will start with one from Julie Burley dos Santos. He asks, my major I think this is more a comment, but I will pass it on. My major question along the, the years is not about the role, rather than what differentiates science communication from any other kind of communication. What are your views on this? Thank you, Julie. Yeah, thank you. A really good question. Um, as a social scientist, of course, I have to answer, it depends. Um, it depends on what you are looking at, because I think in some respects, um, we don't need to differentiate between science and other forms of public communication. Um, and in looking at the news media, for instance, I think um, similar logics often apply across topics. Um, so, um, so I think at least in some contexts and spaces, um, science is not necessarily a special case for public communication. I guess I would want to argue that there are some differences. I mean, we can talk about the technical complexity of some scientific topics that perhaps makes it a special case for, you know, thinking about how to how to do communication, how to explain clearly complex um, dynamics. I, I think one other important argument is that science is this kind of hugely powerful entity in our societies. Scientists have huge amounts of authority, you know, of course, different in different spaces and perhaps shifting, but still are very authoritative speakers. Um, science gets huge amounts of public funding. Uh, in these respects, I think we can say, yeah, there is something somewhat unusual there that means that we should critically engage with science um, in a way that's perhaps different from some other kinds of um, things that are communicated uh, about. And here, I guess I also would point to parallel work in the Quest project um, that looked at science journalism and journalist practices. And this was something that really came up um, from interviews with with people 
working as journalists, um, speaking of the need to critically investigate science as a site of power in our societies to, again, hold um, uh, science and scientists accountable um, to, to investigate where there might be misuses of power or of money uh, in, in different ways. Sorry, a bit a, a rambling answer. But I hope <laughs> no problem. I know it was very, yeah, very good. Thank you. I think it, it perfectly relates uh, this your last comment you said about the journalism on the second question more voted here in the chat by Nun Miguel Gonçalves. He says, good morning, Sarah. What do you think should be the social posture of the science communicator regarding political issues? Should they be as biased as journalists, for instance? This one last is a question and a comment. So <laughs> thank you, Nun, for your question. Uh, so the social, should, should people take a, an activist role, for instance? Is that the... Should the social posture of the science communicator be uh, regarding political issues? Should we have a stand? Should, as, uh, as in journalism, should they be always neutral and objective or are they they are human and they should take a stand on ever on the thing they, they think is right yeah again a really interesting question that i unfortunately think i don't have a good answer to because i i would actually say this is quite a personal choice about what does it mean to do ethical science communication what what is normatively right for people in different situations um for myself i i mean again um, I come from science and technology studies. This is a discipline that is very keen on pointing out the value-laden laden nature of science. Um, so I think we can never be truly objective um, and independent. We are always caught in webs of relationships um, and have particular views and values. So uh, again, for myself, I think acknowledging that is important and also deciding where uh, it is right um, for you um, to, to be activistic in, in orientation in some way, to take a stance and to, to argue for it. Um, and that may be kind of more important or more urgent with regard to some political questions or situations uh, than others. There may also be other moments where it is right or, or feels like the um, the ethical thing to do to, to try and take a more objective or distanced position and to um, really discuss different um, forms of, of evidence and argument. I think I say this is an ethical issue. I think it can also be a strategic question because um, there are moments when um, we are more persuasive if we are um, showing uh, different kinds of arguments. Um, mm -hmm. So this is perhaps also something to, to take into account. Um, debates around vaccine hesitancy, for instance, mm -hmm. I think it's um, here, uh, from what I've seen of, of research, um, this is an area where um, activism or pro-vaccination activism is not helpful because it's seen as disregarding the concerns and experiences and hesitations that lie behind kind of doubts around taking, um, uh, having vaccines. So here I think is one case where um, both um, ethically, but also strategically, it makes sense to, to really um, be fair and to acknowledge different positions um, and views uh, and values. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And again, I will relate that to the next question about the ethic. I think that's the question, I will read it. Uh, I'll try to interpret it a little bit. It's from Alexander Gerber. It's among our audience, also known uh, science communication scholar and practitioner. He asks, it's related to when, I think he means relating when you said it's an, an enhancing democracy as a role of science communication. How democratic is it actually to try and change people's attitudes and behavior who in a democracy are meant to make their own decisions? He gives the example of nudging. I think he is making the point how democratic it is it when we say it's democratic, but we try to change the or confirm to what we want the opinions of people. I think so. Thank you, Professor Alexander Gerber. Yeah, thank you. Nice point. I mean, I think this is the value of reflecting on these rationales, because, of course, if we say we are enhancing democracy or, or seeking to enhance democracy, but when we look at our practices, it's oriented to 
changing people's minds and convincing them into particular behaviors, then this is a point for reflection, uh, right? Like, right, yeah, exactly. Is this, yeah, is this enhancing democracy? Um, again, I want to point to work by um, Marina Juba, um, who is a scholar in South Africa. She has kind of argued also that a lot of science communication has, I think she calls it, um, mixed motives. Um, so people kind of saying one thing, or that they want one thing and, and doing another. In the UK, of course, this was very obvious in discussion around dialogue. Um, I think many government agencies, at least, saying, um, yes, we want dialogue, we want democracy, but actually both um, their practices, and I think when you spoke to them, indicated that they just wanted to get some public legitimacy for decisions that they'd already made. Um, so, yeah, I think interrogating both these rationales and our own practices or the practices that we see and being kind of brutally honest, I suppose, um, uh, is a good way to go. It's a good way, exactly, because that, that's a, a discussion also. And I think, once again, it will relate to the next question. One of the most voted here is from Ana Teixeira de Melo on this, this side of being reflective and we might need help from others. She asks, how can scientists, philosophers and science communicators best coordinate and work together in science communication? Can we really do good science and good communication without a reflexive partner? So maybe you'd be here on the importance of, you know, uh, talking to philosophers so we can understand this. Are we being really on the democratic side or are we wanting to improve our side of the story? What's your comment yeah. on that? Yeah, thank you. Again, a really great question. Um, and one that somewhat goes to my um, sensitivities, because as I mentioned at the start, this is one, this kind of collaboration is one that I always feel I don't have enough of. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to say that um, communicators of any kind need external actors to enable reflection. I, I mean, as I've said, the people uh, that I know and that I've um, talked to and worked with um, are reflective practitioners. So I think it is, of course, always possible to uh, design um, uh, spaces for reflection uh, that are just kind of uh, within groups or projects or um, uh, organizations. So I don't think it's necessary. Um, at the same time, of course, these interdisciplinary, intersectoral conversations it makes that easier because you're forced to see where there are different perspectives uh, and values. Um, for myself, I have been extremely grateful to um, the Quest project, for instance, which does bring together people in practice and different kinds of scholarship um, uh, and people in you know, university roles uh, as well. Um, and that is always a very rich um, discussion. The, the challenge, of course, is always funding uh, and time to do these things. Um, so I think they are, these kinds of conversations um, are, yes, extremely valuable and useful, um, but not always realistic for, for many people who are in, you know, time or budget pressed situations. Yes, thank you. We, we also have here in, on PT, we, we always have this uh, discussion also we are our association is composed both of practitioners working on university communication offices or in uh, people as explainers or educators working in museums and science museums uh, and also scholars this discussion what should be the role how can we be more reflexive about our our own work and this this again it was as you said of uh, uh, also uh, susan priest said about the democratic and strategic roles and I would go to the question now of Maria Leon. She asks about, uh, uh, especially this practical way. And she says, she asks, in a more practical way, do you think that marketing and publicity tools can help science communication? Or I will uh, uh, complete this, complete or uh, uh, put another question alongside this one is, do you think we should stay away from them and reject them on principle? Or should we apply these tools for science communication? So should we run away from them or should we embrace them? Thank you, Marilio, for your question. Yeah, thank you. I, um, yeah, I, I would have to think about that. Um, 
And I would again be interested in other people's experiences because these are tools that I have not really used myself. Mm -hmm. I and mean, one thing that I can say is that the scholarship around public relations, for instance, and marketing, um, like in science communication, has moved very much away from what is often imagined as being marketing. Um, so when people are writing or researching or arguing for forms of public relations, these are actually now you know grounded um, in relationships with communities and being responsive to audiences and uh, engaging with people's real needs so actually i think there are some parallels there with science communication um, again i mean i guess i feel like there is always something to learn from all kinds of practices um, so where i don't know branding activities are done in really exciting ways or innovative ways perhaps this can give us ideas for uh, science communication practice as well so I, I think i definitely wouldn't want to say we should you know we should stay away we shouldn't touch them um of course again it's about being a reflective practitioner and thinking about the tools that we use and why also perhaps the values and imaginations that they bring along with them. Because um, if we talk about tools or techniques for different forms of communication, these are never entirely innocent. They always bring particular um, visions of what communication is and um, who the audience is as well. Um, so it comes back to this point, I guess, about being finding spaces and ways of being reflective. Um, just from what you, I just add briefly, because. Um, from what you, you said, um, I was also thinking, again, for me, one of the most valuable spaces for this kind of reflection has exactly been meetings like this one and organizations like this one. Um, so science communication associations or networks that bring together a mix of, of research and practice and also scientists. Um, uh, so I think this is one very nice way that this kind of reflection can be engineered into a everyday work thank you thank you thank you Anna. i was i think in the name of the, of the association um let me say also uh, thank you for that point because it, 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 this is a personal note where you said even public relations or marketing are evolving because many times when you if we are not reflexive and know about other fields and we think about marketing as being static and being in the 1940s where it was just a way of persuasion and marketing tools and public relation has evolved and has embraced also the idea of two-way communication and engaging with the public it's not only the idea of trying to sell things so there's also evo evolution in science communication and public relations and so on let me go oh it's almost 10 30 but I, I will have time for another question uh, i will go to this one uh, sarakura she asks uh, your opinion does the current pandemic situation and the increasing spread of fake news conspiracy theories and society polarization enhance even more the role and responsibility of science communication what's your intake on this um yes i, I think would be my answer and um, i was actually hoping no one would ask me a question about the pandemic because i think it's such a complicated situation it's one that i find very hard to make kind of judgments and, and arguments in. But in answer to that question, yes. I mean, this is a moment where we are really seeing science in the making in public. Um, it raises all kinds of challenges for all kinds of science communication. But I, I think exactly it's also an important moment for science communication and for science communication to engage with questions of democracy and working with communities rather than kind of speaking from on high. So yes, definitely a difficult moment, but I think an exciting one. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. I have to, uh, I'm, we are really on the end of our time, but before finishing, of course, I would like to say thank you, Sarah, for your time and your kindness uh, uh, and patience to endure our links and our emails and our tests. Thank you very much for this. And just an interesting talk and an interesting topic. I also would like to thank uh, Anna Matias. It was here creating the, the comment box. Uh, and of course, for our audience, because it's for them we are doing this. Thank you very much for being on the other side of the screen and writing your questions. So thank you. Thank you all. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, I will say this in Portuguese as a reminder. For, we have a lot of, and you know, I also would like Sarah, if she has the time for long today or tomorrow to go 
on the other on the other parts of the conference, especially the expo, where we have a lot of the uh, uh, debates on the more freestyle. We have presentations, we have showing of podcasts, we have workshops and debates. Uh, uh, the people on the organization asked me to say that we are we had a, we will have another workshop that is not included in the program. That is from the science project. That is a TNA. How can I have my thesis published? So it's a very, uh, especially for me, it's a very it's a hot topic. So, uh, uh, um, so what I want to say is uh, thank you all, the audience, organization. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, we right now will be starting another uh, uh, block of uh, uh, oral presentations from a lot of Portuguese and uh, and foreign researchers presenting their works here. So thank you very much. And now go go to the sessions we have starting now. Go to the expo. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. It was a really interesting time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for me again. Um, thank you, Manuel. Thank you, everybody. Um, if anyone is interested, please do drop me a line. My email was on the slides. Um, yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>